Hi everyone, I'm Lisbeth Marquez and I'm here today with Justina Page and we're here to find out about your story, Justina. I know that you've been through quite a lot these last few years and from doing my research on you, I see that you're an author, an actress, you're a speaker, a voice talent, a burn survivor, and you're also the founder and executive director of Amos House of Faith. All true. Yes. <laughs> okay. So how long ago did um, did the the incident happen? The house fire happened March 7th, 1999. Okay. So we're talking about 25 years ago. 25 years ago. Yes. Okay. Okay. So tell us about, um, I know that you, your resume is impressive. Um, all of the things that you've done, <laughs> uh, particularly being an author, um, actress, of all those titles that you hold, uh, which one are you the most proud of? The one that's not listed. Okay. Wife and mother. It's the simple things that uh, I'm excited about. To be able to do all of that and maintain my uh, being a mother and a grandmother and uh, married to my awesome brown sugar, that works for me. Okay, that works for you. <laughs> Very important to note that distinction. Uh, that's great. So tell us about uh, about you, Justina. Uh, tell us about your background. Um, how how did the fire come about? Sure. Okay. So we'll step back to my background. Um, of course, I married young. My husband and I have been married for 36 years, but we met in college. Um, we married. He had an internship with um, Shell Oil. We wind up coming down to Houston. Um, made a life here, had six sons, six, six, wow, six boys. Six boys. I was trying for a girl. I was really trying, <laughs> but last one was twin boys. So we had a family. We were in the church. Um, um, he was a head deacon. I did youth ministry. We just had a lot of fun, you know, was enjoying life and woke up one evening to the house, um, totally engulfed in flames. TVs popping. It was horrific. Yeah. Obviously, the carbon monoxide had put us all out. So I was the first one to wake up. I uh, turned to my husband. I hit him in the head and say, look, hey, the house is on fire. He throws me out, just natural reaction to throw me out of the house. And um, I was a homeschool mom at the time. So I had taught my children fire safety. They knew the point to go to the older ones. But I had twin boys. They were only 22 months. So what I did was jump back in and made an attempt to go get my twin sons. Unfortunately, in that attempt, I got, things were falling. It, it, you know, fires are chaotic. You know, um, a big bookshelf in our room, We, my husband was the reader, really. I read some, but the big uh, bookshelf fell on me and I was trapped inside. Um, my husband had went to the point to get the four older boys and he was able to get them out. All of them were burned. Um, and then I guess I could hear him calling me, where are you? Where are you? And he was able to retrieve me again because I was trapped. Unfortunately, um, he had to run all the way around the house. The fire was so bad. He couldn't go from our master bedroom to the nursery. He had to go around the block to the back neighbor's back fence jump over those fences to get to the nursery. He pulls one of the twin sons out who is totally engulfed in flames. Um, and he screamed, he's a baby. He didn't know to keep his mouth shut. So he's burned internally as well. Facial, upper extremities, this is bad business. Meanwhile, I have a neighbor drag me from the window up to um, the front of the lawn and hold me up with her head to my head because she could touch my skin. You know, things, skin was falling off. It's, it's really, really bad business. And then before um, he was able to get the last twin, the house caves in. So that's um, up until that point. No, it's okay. Yeah, it was, it's bad. It was pretty bad business it, it is literally a miracle that any of us are alive yeah i don't think i can i'm sorry i don't uh, i probably should have asked you that last i'm sorry no it's okay I'm just, it's okay it's a very appropriate response uh, i'm 25 years out i've told this story you know quite a bit um but i feel the same way trust me it hurts it still hurts yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm sorry too. This story gets very real. It really does. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Because yeah, I know a course. lot of people that go through trauma are not open to talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It can be difficult for some. I, I do have a backing, though. I am a believer. I have the Lord, which helped me later. It didn't help me at the beginning. So I want to throw that in there. I did go mm -hmm. through a lot of division in my, you know, anger and all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, so while you were in that recovery mode, physically and emotionally recovering, how were you, how did you get through being able to support your family? Because they still looked at you as mom. They, your husband still looked at you as wife and needed your support. How did you get through that? Well, first I had to get, they had to bring me through first. Um, that happened first. Um, I was in a coma probably for about six to eight weeks. Um, my, they told my husband that me nor the other twin were gonna make it. We had 0% chance to survive. Um, by the grace of God and praying people, we did make it. Um, but I did wake up innovated, you know, breathing tube in, you know, it was horrific. So before I was able to even think about supporting them, they supported me first. I remember, um, when I was first able to see my children. Now, understand my children are my world. Mm -hmm. Even all these grown men, they're still my world. Mm -hmm. um, and um, especially at that time, those were my babies. And I was so excited. I was able to finally sit in a neuro chair, is what they called it, and go see my kids for the first time in the waiting room. And there's tubes going everywhere. You know, um, you know, it, it's just bad business. Being burned is just, horrific you know it's so much that goes into that but I remember them willing me out to see my kids and my heart was just beating because I hadn't seen them like in months you know and I had one son with autism and when he saw me he took off running so fast that my husband had to chase him to find him and my heart just dropped and I it, it dawned on me okay my appearance is altered he may not even have recognized me or whatever but my oldest son gathered his other brothers. Of course, Ben was in the hospital too, but he gra he, he got the one, two, I have to count them out, the two under him, and he, 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 he helped me, and he brought them over to me. He said, this is our mother. She's been hurt very badly, and she needs us now. Go hug her. <laughs> yeah, and that's what he did. He took control, you know. So that's how he supported me. Of course, my husband was there every day visit my son every day, did not miss one day, it helped me tremendously. So uh, the honest truth is they had to support me first. Okay. And when I got home, I could still couldn't use my hands. I couldn't do anything. Yeah. But it did turn back around when I was able to take, put, resume that role again and be the support that I am today. Okay. Okay. Good. Because you also suffered burns on your hands and... Yeah, my, I was burned 55% of my body third degree and then other uh, spaces too. But okay. yeah, yeah, I couldn't walk. I couldn't use my hands. I couldn't even go to the restroom. Okay. I needed a lot of assistance. And how was that recovery process? Um, I'm sure there were a lot of teams of doctors that were involved in oh, your recovery. Oh, my God, yes. Yeah. So it was hard because, first of all, you had to deal with physical therapy and you had to deal with occupational therapy, upper upper body, lower body. Everything hurts, <laughs> everything's hurt. And then your hands are super sensitive. So one of the therapies was to put my hands or the part of my hand, I had a partial amputation in rice. And just, and you just, you just screaming because the nerves, everything is super sensitive and it's painful. And then you had skin grafts which hurt like the dickens because you had the scarlet red and they had to tear that off. And oh. So basically they're shaving your skin, stretching it and applying it to the body to cover all the open areas. And I have a lot of open areas all down my back, all down my buttocks, all on my arms, you know. So it was a lot. It was a lot uh, physically. It was a lot mentally. It was a lot spiritually. It took time. Mm -hmm. I had to reconcile a lot of things. I had to learn a lot of things. Okay. 
Okay. And tell me about the um, the Amos House of Faith. How did that come about? What At what point did you decide it's time to go out there and help others that have gone through the same thing? Well, um, okay, so one of the experiences I had on the unit, first of all, what I saw, I saw many patients die. And it wasn't, well, the pain itself can kill you, to be honest. But it was more so from being neglected, being alone. A lot of wives left husbands. A lot of husbands left wives. A lot of children wouldn't speak to the adults because they were spooked or whatever. And uh, I, I thought that was I said to myself, when I get, get out of here, I'm going to make sure everybody has somebody. So that was my first thing. I became a volunteer, and that was maybe about three years out. That did not happen right after. It took time to heal mentally, to heal physically, you know, to even have that thought. But I did remember I said I was going to do that. So I went back on the unit. I became a volunteer, and God knows the type of person I am. I'm a fixer. Mm -hmm. So when I see problems, I try to fix it. And I kept seeing, saying, um, this needs to be done, and this needs to be done for these survivors and that. And then I got that tap on my shoulder, what are you doing? I said, I'm complaining like everyone else. So I decided to um, do the Amos House of Faith twofold to be a blessing for others and to help in areas I know because I had been affected in all areas. I was the survivor. I was the mother of a survivor. I had lost a, a, a child. I had children that had been burned. I, it's like I covered the whole gamut with one experience. But the other was to do something in memory of Amos to make um, his death have meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what, in what areas do you all need help as an organization? How can the community come together to help you all? Um, well, volunteers are always welcome um, with the different programs and things we do. Of course, money is the answer to all things. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it would help with a lot of things. I have many programs that I do, but the one that I have not been able to get off the ground and going is Amos Place. Mm -hmm. Amos Place uh, will be, when we get it done, a spot for the caretakers of severely burned patients to stay, much like the Ronald McDonald House. Um, while their um, patients are going through surgeries and different things, or basically while they're waiting to see if they're going to make it or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds really harsh, but that's the reality of it. When the um, What people don't understand about burn trauma centers, they're spread out. People are life flighted in from like over 500 to 600 miles away to the nearest uh, burn center. So you have the family coming in, they're already, you know, hurt and scared and frightened, but then they can't afford to park, they can't afford to eat, and they have absolutely nowhere to stay. Then you have the HIPAA laws, so they can't stay in the patient's rooms, they can't stay on the little couches outside, so they're just, it's tragic, you know. So mm -hmm. that's something I really want to fix and what I would like to do. So I would take a building, a small house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't even need, you know, Ronald McDonald House. I used to volunteer for them. They have a big, nice facility. I'm not even needing that. Just a small home, three or four bedrooms, because usually you normally won't have more than three or four, you know, very critical patients at one time that would need that. But that type of thing. Okay. And what is the, in Houston, where are the burn centers in Houston? Oh, it's only one. There's only Houston. one in Houston. Yeah. And the and next the, one is over in Dallas. Uh, UTMB down in Galveston has one as well, but it's a very small one. Okay. But yeah, it's at the uh, Memorial Hermann in the Texas Medical Center. Okay. John S. Dunn Senior Burn Unit. And on average, do you know how many burn victims there are there? They can only house 14. 14. It's 14 bedrooms, and it stays full most of the time. Really? Yeah, and sometimes there's an overflow into other intensive care units, but then sometimes it's lower. Um, last I checked, it was 14 beds in use. Okay, for a city of 7 million Exactly, people. and some of those are like flighted in. Like, I have some patients. I run the support systems there on that unit. Mm -hmm. I trained the volunteers there, so I I just became the big mama bear over there. Okay. And um, um, there's two patients now, one from California and someone from 
somewhere else. They just happen to be out in the woodlands when the accident happened. But they get life flighted from other neighboring cities all the time. Yeah. Okay, okay. And um, let's talk about prevention a little bit. Sure. What can people do to prevent something like this from happening? First of all, make sure your smoke alarms, that's one. Number one, a lot of times what people do and what I did, you get annoyed, you're cooking, and the smoke alarm goes off, and it's like it's, it's a nuisance. And so if, what you do, you take the battery out. And you say, I don't want to hear that right now. Fatal mistake. Also, you can have your home sprinklered. I did not know. I thought that was just for commercial buildings. But your home can have the little firefighter right in there. And there's myths about fire sprinklers, like it'll flood the house. It costs so much or whatever, but it only goes off when the temperature gets a certain point, and it will only go off uh, um, at the point where the temperature is. It won't go off all over the house. Hollywood has messed us up the way they represent the fire sprinklers and stuff like that. So that's another thing. Another thing is to have a plan and practice the plan. Mm -hmm. Take your children, and that's what saved our children's life. My husband was real good about I had took them as a homeschool mother down to the fire museum. Mm -hmm. It was a field trip. It was a fun thing to do, and we wrote out our plan. And, but that thing saved their lives. So have a plan and practice the plan. Okay. Do you all know where the fire happened in your home? The um, official report said undetermined. My husband's investigation said faulty wiring and attic. Okay, so it was a builder problem. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, my only other question is, what's next? What's next for you? <laughs> fun, fun stuff for me. I mean, um, God has really blessed me to do so many things. Um, as far as the Amos House, in February, on the 25th, we're going to have our annual gala. Um, that's our major fundraiser, so... I'm excited about that, preparing for that. Um, as far as me personally, I mean, there's movies. I'll be, um, I have a couple of movies coming out that I'm in this year. One came out in September, and then the TV series, the second season will be coming out uh, the turn of the year, and then we'll be back shooting. Okay. Yeah. And what is that about? Well, um, Breaking Strongholds is a faith-based movie that deals with issues like teen suicide, um, um, eating disorders, just different things that affect our teens. Okay. And, um, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Pretty exciting. Okay. Well, that was um, – thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It was mm -hmm. – it, it was very difficult for me to go um, th now thinking back about our conversation. I'm getting all teary eyed again. Um, so thank you for sharing your story with us. And um, please let us know how we can be of assistance to you and possibly contributing to help see that long term vision of the Amos House come through uh, for your organization. We would love to be a part of that. And one last question. How can we get in touch with, with you all? How can people connect with you online? Sure. There's Just Google my name and you'll find 50,000 ways. But mm -hmm. anyway, uh, my website, uh, JustinaRPage.com, www.JustinaRPage.com. The letter R? Mm-hmm. And your last name is spelled? P-A-G-E, like a book. Like a book, okay. That's one way. You can always email me, Justina, at JustinaRPage.com. Okay. Yeah, and of course, the uh, nonprofit website, theamoshouse.org. And do you have corresponding social media yes. accounts for those as yeah, well? Yeah, all across the board. All right. Well, thank you so much, Justina. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to more follow-up interviews with you. I look forward to it as well. Thank you yeah. for having me. You're welcome.